says. All right, everybody, it's starting. So tonight's speaker is someone who joined us a few months ago. And Professor Giulio Antonio Bertelli is a professor of Italian at Osaka University. And so with that, I give you Professor Bertelli, please. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, okay. for coming tonight. Or well, and uh, good evening to everyone, uh, and good morning to everyone uh, who is in uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, okay, I'll just um, share the slides. Okay. Uh, so okay. So, um, Can you see everything? Yeah. Looks good. Okay. Wow. OK, so uh, the title of my talk is A Western Woman Traveling to the Interior of Japan in 1869. Uh, and uh, well, the, it's about some documents, the travel journals of uh, this lady, uh, Mathilde Salier de la Tour, who was uh, the spouse of the uh, first uh, Italian minister plenipotentiary to Japan. And uh, I am. Uh, Julie Bertelli uh, from uh, Osaka University, and I'm teaching Italian basically and uh, history, uh, especially history of uh, um, Italo Japanese relations. And uh, uh, first uh, of all, um, I would like to uh, introduce the history of um, uh, Italo Japanese relations because very little is known, is known about uh, the position of Italy in Japan around the years of the Meiji Restoration. And, uh, uh, but in the last uh, 30 years, uh, we had, uh, uh, well, both in Italy and Japan, we had um, a number of researchers who uh, found uh, many documents and did uh, a lot of research about this topic. Uh, but, um, well, it's very, you know, closed world and everybody is uh, thinking only about uh, Italy. Um, so, um, I thought to uh, just to, um, you know explain a, a little bit this uh, this word, and uh, uh, Italy's political role in Japan is absolutely uh, secondary if compared to Britain, to U.S. or like uh, France, etc. But uh, there was a very strong uh, commercial uh, tie. Well, um, they had. Um, Italy and Japan had very strong commercial ties uh, and they were centered on the silkworm egg trade for about 20 years from six, uh, 1860 to 1880s. And uh, this exchange was an important source of currency for Japan uh, and uh, it was uh, crucial to save the economy of Italy because there was a, a crisis caused by pebrine, which is a silkworm disease, which is now, even nowadays uh, possible to cure. And uh, this brought an unprecedented crisis in all over Europe, especially in Southern Europe, France, and Italy. And uh, so um, the uh, silkworm uh, breeding um, silkworm farmers uh, had to send people around the world to collect, to buy some unaffect, unaffected uh, silkworms uh, around the world. First went to Eastern Europe, then to uh, Persia, Bangladesh, China, and then finally they arrived to Japan. Uh, in the first half of the 60s, uh, 1864, when still no treaty was signed between uh, Japan and Italy. So uh, the work was very hard, they had to Go to the other side of the world without knowing where to go and uh, without anybody there to rely on. So they could rely only on uh, uh, just uh, other foreign traders and they had to just trust them. And also the Bakufu prohibited the export of silk and eggs for a while. Uh, so um, it was a very difficult situation for them. So uh, the treaty was, signing of the treaty was necessary. And this happened in 1866, uh, when uh, the first treaty between, first commercial treaty between Italy and Japan was signed. Uh, so um, the following year, uh, this um, gentleman uh, came to Japan as a minister 
plenipotentiary of Italy, uh, and he was uh, representing the king of Italy in Yokohama. He had full powers to represent uh, uh, the king. This is the meaning of plenipotentiary. And uh, uh, his mission was to basically to protect and coordinate and uh, um, facilitate silk or mag trade. And uh, without any, um, without uh, interfering with the, uh, the country's uh, domestic politics and with other powers' interests. So he had very precise, but uh, somehow ambiguous uh, orders to follow. Uh, because also the foreign Italian foreign minister didn't know anything about Japan. So he left uh, uh, for Japan, he arrived there, but uh, he had many problems because he didn't have anything to rely on. He's, he didn't have any guards, he didn't have interpreters. He, and the, the Italian government refused to give him, to send him some interpreters because of financial problems. Like, of course, uh, for uh, that time, uh, 1867, it was just after the Third uh, Independence War. So yeah, uh, there wasn't so much money. And uh, so, uh, yeah, he had a lot of work to do at the beginning. And uh, he stayed in Japan for uh, two and a half years and a few months in China. And uh, well, he uh, didn't even have a warship in Yokohama to rely on, uh, uh, no guards, no, nothing. Uh, so uh, it was very difficult. Uh, it was a very difficult mission for him at the beginning. And uh, uh, he had those to found the first uh, legation. We have a map of Yokohama here. And uh, the first, the very first legation and consulate were based at number 90 of the foreign uh, settlement. While uh, after a while, after a few months, at the end of 1867, uh, he moved here. Well, this is an older uh, map, but uh, in, um, he moved in the building that used to be of the Dutch legation. And then, uh, well, uh, this part of the town is called Benten. Uh, it's in the Benten zone of Yokohama. And also, um, also a, con a consul came and he had to found the consulate. And uh, this is an Ishikie, which uh, illustrates the uh, Italian consulate in Yokohama, in Benten, uh, Honmachi, uh, Honcho, Honcho, sorry. And it was very close to the uh, French uh, legation as well. And uh, um, luckily, uh, Salia de la Tour could rely on these people. Uh, first of all, Count Marco Arese here, which uh, uh, he actually, um, well, uh, Salia de la Tour thought he could rely on him, but he wasn't uh, very zealous, we can say. He didn't like his job very much and uh, he didn't help very much, actually, uh, as also Mathilde uh, will say. And uh, also, uh, well, he, he has been in Japan for a while and then at some point he went back and he was succeeded by uh, Baron Galvania, who is the, another secretary. Then we had the consul, Robecchi, which is in this uh, lower uh, right picture, who uh, came in Japan in July 1867. And uh, on the ship coming to Japan, he met this young man who is, whose name is Pietro Savio. And uh, he was uh, just, he was traveling because he had a heartbreak and uh, he just ran away from Italy because he didn't want to meet, uh, uh, well, he couldn't uh, just uh, stay together with this woman he liked and he ran away, just choose, he chose uh, the, the farthest country in the world to go without any purpose. And uh, on the ship, he met uh, Consul Robecchi who, decided to hire him in the consulate. And Pietro Savi wasn't a diplomat or anything, but he just was just a random guy who was on the ship. And he was hired by the consulate and he worked for a while also at the legation. And uh, he actually was uh, very uh, helpful for, for them. And uh, he um, also started seriously to study Japanese. 
as well. And he wrote uh, some books about Japan, uh, as we will see. And uh, um, of course, he, Salier de la Tour, could rely on his wife, Mathilde Salier de la Tour. She was born in Paris as Mathilde Ruinard de Brimont, uh, who is uh, well, a well-known family and is renowned uh, for the production of champagne. And uh, uh, they met um, when Victorio's, uh, uh, Salier de la Tour's uh, elder brother married her sister. So uh, they, they were basically two brothers marrying two sisters. And uh, well, they started uh, just spending some time together. And then uh, at some point they met again in 1864 when her mother died. And uh, in that occasion, Vittorio tried to ask to marry Mathilde to her family, but he was refused because he had a passion for gambling. He liked to gamble and uh, the family didn't uh, actually like that. So uh, they just refused him. And uh, uh, after that, he was sent to Mexico City, but he kept correspondence uh, with uh, uh, Mathilde. Uh, they kept exchanging letters and they kept in touch. And uh, when he came back from Mexico, he had lost everything by uh, gambling. And he didn't have, well, he had uh, actually a lot of debts. And um, then, well, uh, he still liked Mathilde and Mathilde uh, liked him, but uh, he couldn't ask again to her family to marry her. And her idea was to use her dowry to pay debts he had. And um, so she had to convince him that he wasn't very, uh, like he didn't want to ask the family and uh, she had convinced also her family. But in the end, uh, she succeeded and they got married in, um, on February 9th, 1867. Just two months before leaving for Japan. So this um, new mission of Vittorio to Japan was uh, kind of a honeymoon for them. And they started their um, life together during this trip uh, to Japan. They started to, uh, to know each other better, to live together, and uh, et cetera. And uh, so they left for Japan. And uh, uh, about Mathilde, we can say uh, also from her documents, but also from uh, third parties, that uh, she was a very talented and fascinating woman. And uh, she was often admired for her courage and her cold blood. And uh, Pietro Savio, uh, who was working at the consulate, uh, describes her like, uh, well, she was uh, very, uh, she was born in a very, uh, just, uh, 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 well, she belonged to the finest uh, aristocracy of uh, Paris. And uh, she was still young and curvy, and she had a distinguished personality. And uh, she had many talents. She spoke, uh, she spoke uh, several languages, and she knew very well music. And uh, she was a very skillful painter, etc. And uh, her cold blood and courage could compete with whoever was not of her same sex, she, uh, he says. To tell the truth, I would say that in various circumstances, uh, she demonstrated herself to be more courageous than men. That is how she, he described her. And uh, this uh, um, courage uh, brought her to follow her husband to the other side of the world. But this following uh, doesn't mean that she was passive. She was uh, pretty uh, active. Actively, actively protecting him and uh, just uh, from temptations of gambling and dangers. And also she was going to help him as a like in his work as a diplomat. And um, well, her husband didn't like very much uh, her curious recklessness. Sometimes she was like going on uh, horseback on the Tokaido, <laughs> just bringing her gun and uh, uh, asking Pietro Savio to follow her. Just come with me, it's gonna be fine, come on. And then she left and uh, she went at the gallop and on the Tokaido. That was very dangerous, of course. We know also like, uh, 
Nama movie Jiken and uh, all these uh, facts uh, with that, that happened to foreigners in the uh, previous years. Anyway, um, she could, well, also her husband was very busy and she could enjoy a very large um, span of action in Yokohama and a delegation, of course. So she was uh, basically free and uh, she had uh, a lot of time left uh, while uh, also her husband was busy. Uh, so she wrote a lot uh, while she was in Japan. And uh, she observed Japan um, from uh, 1867 uh, uh, to 1870. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, well, there are not so many sources about women writing uh, about Japan in this period, especially in the, around the Meiji Restoration. And uh, these uh, documents are all stored in the Salier de la Tour archive, which is a private archive in, uh, uh, in Italy. And they are um, very, uh, well, they have many, many uh, features, interesting features. And uh, just to make them available for scholars, I transcribed the manuscripts and translated them into English uh, and just published them in uh, January this year. And the title is The Travel Journals of Matilde. Well, it's very similar to uh, this presentation. And then uh, here, I would like to introduce these five manuscripts that she wrote about Japan. Uh, so um, I write some, I, I took some uh, parts of the translation of the, my English translation and uh, put it on the slides. Uh, I won't read everything. So you can check it if you want to read it uh, and uh, want to have uh, some, uh, just uh, read it, um, uh, not in a hurry. Uh, and, uh, if you want to just read it calmly, uh, you can just watch the video and pause it when uh, there is something you want to, uh, you want to read. Uh, so, first of all, we have the first manuscript, which is about the journey to Japan. And uh, um, it is about mainly Egypt and Asia and different parts of Asia from April to June, uh, from April to June uh, 1867. And uh, uh, well, uh, this is a very neat and clean copied manuscript. It wasn't very difficult to, uh, to read. And uh, it's, uh, well, it's pretty long. It's 134 pages in total. And the second part is a little bit, um, there are a little bit of corrections and cross outs and uh, well, it's not really uh, polished. Anyway, uh, this manuscript is about uh, her like uh, leaving from Italy and uh, her stay in Egypt, and uh, especially in, in Alessandria, in Cairo. Uh, and then she goes to the pyramids, uh, she goes on a cruise on the Nile. And uh, she was very enthusiastic uh, to, to travel and see the world. She never, she had never left Paris before. Uh, so she was very happy uh, about that. She was with the man she could marry against the will of her family. So um, they were spending some time together. And uh, at some point, Victor, her husband, Vittorio, he gets sick uh, in Egypt and um, he cannot go to see the pyramids. So uh, she decides to go by herself. And uh, so he makes her promise not to climb on the top of the pyramids, but she would have done that. So uh, just stop, calm down, <laughs> just don't climb on the pyramids, okay? This is a promise. So uh, she went and then she came back, like she, she went, she kept her promise actually, and uh, she saw everything. And then she met also the, the people who were in charge of the, uh, excavation, the Egyptologists. And, uh, um, and then uh, she was like really, uh, when she went to the pyramids, she wanted very badly to meet her new, newlywed husband, Vittorio. So she started with a, with a horse and at a gallop, she came back and everybody was following her. 
and uh, the secretary Arese was uh, like still holds grudge for for this gallop. And uh, also she um, has a cruise on the Nile, on the Dahabia, uh, or I don't know how to pronounce that. But, um, and uh, uh, well, she uh, enjoys a lot her stay in Egypt. Then um, the second part is, a long part is about Suez, the Suez Canal. She is witnessing the, uh, uh, the works, uh, the excavation works of the canal, and she actually meets the uh, very, um, like the chief engineers, uh, also, well, um, Ferdinand de Lesseps and the other people who were in charge of the excavation works. And uh, also she stops in uh, Aden, Ceylon, uh, Singapore, Saigon, Hong Kong, Shanghai, before reaching Japan. And then um, towards the end of this manuscript, she writes about her first, her very first impressions about Japan. And she arrives there uh, with her husband, uh, Yokohama uh, Pierre, and nobody was there waiting for them. And uh, well, they disembarked under blazing sun, she says. And then uh, she goes to a hotel and this place was so miserable. And then she looked out of the window on the balcony and uh, she saw only no houses, people, like Japanese people, half naked people shouting and carrying uh, the baggage. And so, uh, yeah, she was depressed. Like, uh, <laughs> so I had to live here. Like I have to spend my newlywed life in a place like this. And she started crying. And then uh, also uh, the French minister Roche came to invite them to his house. But uh, Victor decided to refuse because he didn't want to, he had uh, some sort of pride and he didn't want to look, to, um, just look under the protection of somebody else, basically. He didn't want to, um, uh, that people thought that he was under French protection or British protection or whatever. He, wanted, he just wanted to stay by himself and uh, stay independent. So, um, then we, uh, we can start talking about the second manuscript, which is about Yokohama and Edo. Uh, and here Mathilde is describing many uh, things about Japanese culture. She, she is talking about basically the first impressions she had. And this manuscript was uh, pretty difficult to, uh, to read because there are many cross outs and uh, she wrote it probably very hastily, very quickly. Uh, so it was uh, it wasn't so easy, uh, but um, and also it was left incomplete. Uh, so that's uh, that's a shame. But um, she writes uh, a lot about these two cities, about the very first impressions. This is about uh, 1867, and uh, um, she writes many things. About, well, she first of all described the cities and. Uh, <laughs> She writes about uh, Japanese lifestyle and uh, customs, like uh, the hairstyles of the Japanese and uh, bathing, of course, uh, toilets and children, especially children and women, and uh, food. She, she enjoyed very much Japanese food, which is not so common uh, between Westerners, especially Italians. They, they usually they didn't like uh, raw fish, especially or like. Uh, Japanese food, um, so she uh, she liked it, and uh, uh, also she talks about the high cost of life and practical matters uh, about uh, life in Yokohama. And uh, it is interesting here because she tries to just get into the Japanese point of view and see foreigners from the Japanese point of view. Uh, for example, when she, when she talks about baths, she says, uh, okay, yeah, everybody, every Westerner is getting, uh, is making a fuss about uh, bathing, but uh, yeah, it's very natural for her. Like it's a natural thing. They, they go just um, naked in the, uh, in the bathtub. But uh, she thinks about like about her roommate, her Japanese maid, like probably um, 
asked her, why do you, just Western women, like uh, show your cleavage to people? Uh, that's not as natural as taking a bath. Why do you show your body like that? Uh, so um, this is what she uh, thought. Um, she's trying to uh, just see foreigners from Japanese point. Also, um, we have, well, she talks about um, other just diplomats uh, who were in Yokohama, for example, uh, Parks. She doesn't talk about um, so much about Harry Parks, but she talks about uh, his wife, uh, Fanny Parks, uh, Francis Hannah Parks, uh, who is uh, who invited her to uh, a British legate, legation in uh, in Edo, and uh, she says, uh, uh, "I'm happy to have found uh, her here. She has five children. The two eldest of them are in Britain. I want to be her friend, regardless of her missionary feeling, which brings brings her to an excessive charity for all those who are sad, sick, or poor." Uh, and then, well, she says that. Uh, she was put in a very large room. Probably she read something about the Tozenji Jiken and she was scared about uh, this situation. So like partitions are very thin. So everybody like maybe somebody can get in. So uh, I prefer to sleep with my gun under the pillow, she says. <laughs> and so um, also she has an experience of um, an earthquake here. Uh, so, well, she says, uh, I felt that it had been lifted by an invisible force. And I saw the door slamming the partition stir, uh, stir and uh, heard creaking sound from all sides. Uh, so, yeah. And then she says, I quietly sat down again. Nothing happened. So she wasn't very uh, scared. Anyway, uh, also she has like very adventurous uh, promenades on horseback with uh, Leon Roche and uh, other people from the French legation. Uh, and also uh, she has lunches, lunch um, meetings with uh, uh, Max von Brandt, the Prussian minister. And uh, well, we, here we have two examples. I'm not going to uh, read everything, but uh, the first time like we have storm in Tokyo and it's, uh, well, um, she was going uh, on a promenade on horseback with some people from the French legation and some of them, they get lost. And uh, they had, well, she and the others had to look for them. So they were running on their horse and it was raining. There were lightnings and uh, uh, night was coming. And it was very, started to come, uh, become very dark and it was dangerous, it was a dangerous area of Edo. So, um, she says that, uh, well, in this occasion, I felt myself completely enjoying my existence. And that was certainly happiness. She says, yes, I had everything. I was alive, she says. And um, if someone had come to remind, remind me that I was born in Paris and uh, in good faith, I would have replied, you are wrong. I never had anything in common with those people there. Uh, and in fact, that would not be a lie, she says, because when in some nightmare I think about it, I think about uh, being born in Paris, it, make me, it makes me consider myself as a swallow hatched by chance in a canary cage, she says, and which, uh, while flying as quickly as possible through the clouds, shivers at the memory of its prison. Uh, so, yeah, uh, she is like, uh, she has a kind of conflict between herself, like between this. Um, just elegant and the Parisian part and the wild side. So um, yeah, this is pretty interesting. And uh, this is what uh, makes her so, so fascinating, I think. And uh, um, also uh, we have her describing the uh, lunch with Max von Brandt uh, and uh, she is uh, probably confusing the nori in the miso shiro which is with the spinach leaves. <laughs> she thought that nori was where spinach or something. I don't know. Probably she didn't, she didn't have any idea of what she was eating. But she describes everything very um, precisely. Uh, so, well, and uh, 
she says in short it's not bad and it's so pretty so nicely arranged uh, etc uh, she is very happy with that and uh, also we have some letters for, um, that she sent to her best friend uh, in uh, uh, different points of her stay from 1867 to 70. Three letters are from Japan and the other uh, two are from China. But the most interesting are the first three from Japan. And uh, well, this one here is the second. And uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was not so easy to, uh, it's, it's not, um, it's well written, but the, pa the paper is very thin. So it was very hard to read it because it's written on both sides. So it was pretty much of uh, a nightmare to uh, just decipher it and try to read it. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, she, uh, well, they are, they are actually pretty interesting letters. And uh, uh, they are, um, these letters are particularly um, honest. She's very honestly uh, confessing everything to her friend. Uh, she has like, um, but she complains a lot about different things about her husband. Like we have, we didn't have any uh, interpreter, no guards, uh, nothing. Uh, what is the Italian government thinking? Uh, so uh, she is very um, uh, like complaining a lot about this situation, and uh, also she criticizes very harshly uh, Arese. Uh, he's like a poisonous snake, and he wants to. Uh, put obstacles, uh, obstacles in, uh, to my uh, husband's job, etc. So, so she wasn't so satisfied with that. And uh, also, yeah, she talks about um, like the actual um, diplomacy, uh, like uh, the fact that her husband didn't want to um, show himself as just uh, under the protections uh, of France. So he had an occasion of going to France to bring the credential letters to the Shogun. But in the end, after a, a sleepless night, he doesn't go there. Uh, he just didn't want to go there and look as he was protected by France. So this, uh, this was, uh, there are some insights in her husband's policy, policy, which doesn't come out so uh, often in uh, official documents. So uh, then we have um, the same the same letter. She talks about also the internal situation of Japan, <coughs> the Mikado and the Tycoon. Mikado, which is uh, like uh, uh, gaining power, uh, and uh, the other daimyos. Uh, Etc. She is trying to just uh, uh, put in order the, her thoughts, and she says, "Well, I heard these things uh, during some conversations, so I'm not sure about this." But she was interested in politics. She was interested in what uh, her husband was doing. She was really into it, and this is uh, another interesting point. She talks about the Christians, the missionaries. She was Catholic. And uh, she is talking about uh, Christians a lot, uh, and other different things. Then we have a second letter from, uh, um, which is dated uh, June uh, 1868, and uh, uh, this is about the her husband, uh, who is gaining some influence in the foreign uh, group. I don't know how much, but uh, she says that. Um, uh, with a certain coldness, uh, carefree appearance, very little input and a lot of silence, he has come to exercise on his colleagues some sort of preponderance, all the more effective since it's not apparent. And uh, um, she uh, just uh, says that, uh, well, he doesn't have any means to uh, make his voice stronger, like, you know, um, uh, how do you say, a worships or something like that, but he can just influence other people with his uh, uh, character. And then um, also uh, he was very determined to open the Niigata port to send there the uh, silk buyers. 
uh, to buy the Silicon Max at better prices. And uh, he uh, actually makes it, uh, even if this expedition to Niigata is a failure. Uh, also, um, this letter was suddenly um, interrupted because Mathilde had the labor pains. She, was, uh, she gave birth um, to her daughter, Jeanne, uh, Gianna Francesca, was her in Italian name. And uh, the baby um, was born and then she sent uh, a brief note to her friend to tell, sorry, because my letter just finished there because my daughter was born. Uh, so yeah, um, then uh, she becomes a mother uh, in Japan. Also, um, she sent a last letter, which is the most, uh, the happiest letter in the set. Uh, here we have like, the Italian warship has arrived. Principessa Clotilde is in Yokohama port. Then Arese, the uh, former secretary went back to Italy. He just left Japan and so uh, everything is better. Whoever comes after him, uh, he is the, uh, how do you say, like the Archangel Gabriel, uh, she says. Or like, uh, well, <laughs> and uh, the new secretary, Galvania, was uh, very efficient. So she was happy for that. And then she talks about the reception of the uh, Mikado, uh, who uh, is, uh, uh, who just, called uh, foreign ministers to um, present the credentials. And it, this was a very big event. And we have a sketch by Mathilde, who, like, uh, where uh, her husband gives the credential letters to the, to the Meiji emperor. And we have all the, the people from the, from the corvette, from the warship and the consul, etc. Then, uh, then we have the fourth manuscript, which is the most important uh, of the set, uh, because it's like uh, it's about an expedition in the interior of Japan, which took place from uh, June 8 to uh, 28, 1869. And uh, uh, well, um, here um, Mathilde traveled with the with a group, with her husband uh, first of all, and then uh, some other people, and they went to. Uh, the sericultural areas of um, Ushu and Joshu, which means like uh, uh, Saitama and Gumma. And uh, uh, this uh, manuscript was, um, is actually the, the earliest uh, thing written by a, a Western lady uh, about the interior of Japan. And it was written 10 years, almost 10 years before uh, Isabella Bird's uh, Unbeaten Tracks in Japan was published. And uh, it is quite long. It is uh, 123 manuscript pages. Uh, and um, all her writings are completely in French. Um, and also with this um, journal, we have a sketchbook. And uh, uh, whatever she couldn't describe, she was so amazed that she couldn't describe everything. So she started drawing and uh, making some uh, sketches. And uh, in this small sketchbook, there are 43 uh, sketches. Some of them, they are polished and uh, almost finished like this, like this one you can see here. Some of them, they are like uh, just pencil sketches and some of them are just doodles, uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing more than just simple doodles. But anyway, they are all interesting. Uh, because she writes, um, she uh, writes like um, landscapes, uh, human figures, plants, uh, flowers, and whatever she saw, like everything that amazed her. And uh, this is the route of the mission here. Uh, she started from Yokohama and uh, went to Kawasaki, Tabashi, and then, uh, well, here, in, uh, well, in Saitama Prefecture. Uh, Konosu and uh, Honjo and then Maebashi here in Gumma, uh, then Ikao, Ikaho, uh, which is a hot spring town, and then go, um, well, they turn back to Takasaki, Yamana, Omishi, and uh, Omiya, which is uh, uh, now is Chichibu uh, city in Saitama, uh, also Hara, Ichiba, and then 
Hachioji and then back to Yokohama. And uh, uh, why was it necessary to do this travel in the interior? Uh, basically, um, it was, um, well, the uh, silk or traders to make better business, to buy better quality uh, silk or mags, they needed to know where they, are, they were produced and um, especially the environment they were uh, made and the storage and packaging methods, uh, they, they needed a lot of information in order to buy the mer merchandise and to, uh, you know, to know where like the best uh, produ production sites were. Uh, so, um, but they also put a lot of pressure on the minister to make this uh, expedition. So um, in June, in early June uh, 1869, the minister decided to go uh, with uh, the new secretary, Galvania, with Pietro Savio, the helper, like factotum of uh, the consulate and delegation, and uh, some uh, three, actually three Silicon traders who had a like, very long experience uh, in the past. And of course, uh, well, Mathilde and also the interpreter, Nakayama Joji, uh, Japanese interpreter. And uh, so they left and uh, uh, in this uh, um, occasion, Pietro Savio also wrote a book about this journey as well, which is this one. Uh, you can see it uh, uh, here. Um, and uh, um, this is more like a technical report of the trip. Uh, it's not very, um, uh, it's not talking about uh, happenings and uh, landscapes. Uh, it's talking about very technical uh, matters. Uh, there are some descriptions and it's pretty interesting. Um, but the Mathilde's uh, uh, journal is much more like showing the human side of this uh, uh, journey. Then, um, well, we have also a Nishiki, which uh, is depicting the, the mission. And we can see, like, we can see it here. And it's very long, very rare Nishikie. Uh, we can find a copy in uh, uh, Gumma's Archives of History. Um, and uh, this was a um, uh, property of uh, one of the descendants of the people who accompanied the, uh, the mission in Maibashi, especially. And uh, uh, we can see here Mathilde on the horseback and her husband here and all the uh, Italians, the group of Italians, and uh, also all the guards, the carriers, and uh, everything, everything. And here on the um, upper right side, we have all the participant of the mission and the brief note about uh, what was going on. And here, well, they were entering the town of Maibash in Gumma. Then, well, uh, she talks about a lot of things uh, in this occasion, and uh, she um, talks about the appearance and clothing of the natives and uh, the way that they traveled, actually. Uh, also their houses, lifestyle, uh, landscapes, plants and flowers, which occupies a very important position also in her sketchbook. For example, when she sees like uh, some people of the, uh, of the retinue, she writes uh, like uh, they were under the rain, like wearing the mino, this raincoat. And uh, it was quite curious. They looked like wet ostriches shaking their body after the storm, she says. Uh, so she, well, she has like a lot of uh, these kind of humorous descriptions that make this, um, uh, you know, uh, this journal very enjoyable to read. Also, um, we have some. Um, other uh, parts, for example, when the mission leaves the town and everybody bows down, when, when the guards cry, like just shout, Staniro, like this, everybody's bowing down so uh, they can leave. Also here we have a couple of sketches. This is the one, the only one which is actually colored. Uh, it's a, a small garden, Japanese garden house. And then this is the, uh, the guide, the man who mm. guide the mission in Maibashi, and actually the grandson of this person, whose name is Endo Sohei, 
was the owner of the Nishkie. And one more copy of the Nishkie is in the De La Tour family house. They have, they have it in their living room. Also, um, also, yeah, they had to cross the river, the Tone River, uh, which is a, a river flowing on the uh, in northern Kanto, and it's one of the largest rivers uh, of Japan. And uh, uh, well, this is how they did it. Um, it was very, very, um, the river was very fast, uh, and they had to just cross it. And so they put all the horses and everybody on the on the boat, and then they had some long bamboos. They made spin the boat, and like as she says, like magically it went on the other side of the river, on the other um, uh, bank of the river. Uh, so also we have uh, uh, well, she talks about silk production, and uh, she sees that well, the machinery used to produce silk was very primitive, but the workers were very skillful. And uh, she says that they will they will do incredible things if in Japan there were beautiful organized spinning mills like the one we have in Europe. Uh, so yeah, she was very amazed by uh, this uh, ability of working with very primitive means. Also, uh, well, she has some well in some points uh, in some areas of um, well they they travel. Uh, well, foreigners were known. They never seen, like people never, uh, have, had never seen foreigners, but they heard about them. But in some other areas, like, well, nobody saw any foreigners and never heard talking about them, probably. So um, this was a very, uh, well, she had uh, uh, the opportunity to see how these people reacted and they were just panicking. Like women and children were falling one on each other, and uh, she says it looked like they were being shown some ferocious beasts, uh, which at any time could deceive their guardians and rush on the audience. So yeah, uh, they were very scared, and uh, so um, yeah, she was very amazed by this. Also, uh, well, they spend the night in a, in a monastery, in a temple, uh, and. First of all, they see the monk who was like looking at the foreigners with supreme despise. And uh, then at some point, he just went to them and asked for some cigars. And then he started to smoke cigars and then he had some uh, uh, liqueur and uh, he became friendlier in the, in, in the end. And uh, um, also during the night, everybody was waking up by the sutra. The, the monk chanting the sutra. So, um, well, nobody could sleep anymore. Uh, and um, Mathilde decided to write down the score of the melody, like the melody of the sutra. Uh, and uh, she writes it here. Uh, so yeah, well, this is another uh, strange experience she had. Also, uh, well, we have some more sketches here. We have a small town and some plants, sotetsu, they, they are called sotetsu, I think. Also, we have the toro, the lantern, and uh, uh, the river, the Tone River, again. Also, here we have some more, we have some uh, people uh, crouching, bowing, uh, the thatched roof houses, some other garden, some other people, women carrying, carrying some children, etc. And uh, also, she talks about the photograph in her diary. Uh, and uh, she is like, uh, she says that this photo turned out badly. Uh, it wasn't very good, but it is a good souvenir uh, for the expedition. Uh, so, uh, well, um, actually, the photo was there uh, in De La Tour's uh, living room, actually. And it is this one. You can see it uh, here. And uh, uh, we have Mathilde in the middle on the horseback, and then we have uh, Victor. No, uh, Victor is here probably because of the bird. Uh, it's not easy to recognize him. And then we have some other Italian people. We have Pietro Savio, this guy with a strange hat, Japanese hat, which appears also on the Nishkie. On the Nishkie, there is a, a 
one of the Italians with this hat, so it's very detailed. Also, we have Meazza here, which is another Silicomac trader, and other people. We have the interpreter, Nakayama Joji, which is the only Japanese dressed up as a Westerner, and uh, so on. We have Galvania, the secretary here, and in the background is the Italian legation, uh, which is the one I showed you before. Also, uh, well, um, after the mission, she is complaining about different things. First of all, about the, uh, the French and the British who tried with any means to stop uh, the Italian minister from going into the interior, uh, but they didn't succeed. So they decided to organize another expedition by, uh, by themselves and go to different areas uh, just to see, to say that uh, they, were, they were better. Um, so also she says that uh, they copied the Italian uh, report <laughs> and different things. She was very angry for that, and uh, because she said, "Well, they will, they always want to be the first. Uh, and uh, and also she was angry, um, actually, also with the French, but also with the Italian community, the Italian, the other Italian traders who didn't join the mission, but they were very jealous about that, about the people who could go, and uh, so." was a very, uh, well, in the end, she's very disappointed by that, by that attitude of the Italians. Uh, so yeah, she's very critical. Uh, also, she's critical to, towards the Italian government who says, like, uh, who's called it uh, Victor because, uh, Vittorio, because uh, they thought that he had, he should have uh, done this mission together with the British and the French, but he didn't want to do that. Uh, he wanted to be like independent uh, from everybody and do his uh, job without interfering in other countries' uh, interests. Then we have the last uh, manuscript, which, which is uh, about uh, Western Japan and China. Uh, well, Mathilde and uh, Vittorio had uh, a chance to travel uh, to, um, well, they actually had to go to Siam, Thailand, to ratify a, tri a treaty. Uh, but, um, well, they, they started going on the, uh, well, they, they left Yokohama for going to Siam. But at some point in Shanghai, the mission was canceled. Wow. Suddenly canceled by the Italian government. So they had nothing to do. They, they just went to Shanghai and they were both sick. Um, they had some health problems. Uh, Victor had some uh, troubles with, the, with his knee. He fell off the horse and he injured uh, his leg. And she was tired. She had many things to do, and uh, she had uh, well, she went to the traveling to the interior, and it was very hard for her, I guess. And uh, uh, so she was very tired. And uh, well, um, they are first canceled the mission, and then when they arrived to Hong Kong, uh, they are called back to Italy. So uh, there, that is where the mission is finished. And uh, well, the first part of, the, of this journal is uh, about Japan, about Western Japan, about the uh, Osaka Castle and uh, the Mint Bureau. We can see the pictures here, but they are not from Mathilde. They, these are pictures that uh, I, I found. Uh, but um, also she, well, she visits different parts of Kansai and uh, she also goes to Nagasaki where she talks about the Christian, uh, the Christians, obviously, and uh, um, she talks about Osaka and the resemblance to Venice. They, everybody was saying that Osaka was the Venice of the Far East, but I don't really think so. Or like uh, we have like some, uh, she was looking for artistic inspiration. She saw the ruins of the Osaka castle, which was destroyed the, the previous year. And so like she had an inspiration for a painting with crows flying on the sky and the, and the ruins of the shogunate. Uh, so, yeah. She's, she's writing about uh, different parts of Japan. And also uh, she goes to China and uh, uh, she has a stop, well, from Shanghai uh, to, uh, from uh, Nagasaki to Shanghai, she stops in Saddle Island when, where she meets the pirates. Chinese pirates uh, and uh, 
also, uh, well, they arrived to Shanghai, they get the, cancel, like the mission canceled, and then her enthusiasm is fading away. And she starts to a little bit uh, rest. Uh, she didn't want to go around that period. So we don't have many descriptions of uh, cities or places, but uh, we have some descriptions of the life that, uh, especially the British, who were often like the, the British businessmen, were often uh, acting consuls of Italy. Uh, so they, they run the, also the business for the Italians. Uh, for example, uh, Hogg, Hogg Brothers. And also we have uh, William Keswick of Jardine Matheson in Hong Kong. Uh, also we have, uh, well, we have different peoples, the consul in Amoy, uh, William Pedder. Uh, she talks about different people, also some French people and uh, well, many, many uh, other people. And well, she becomes a little bit gossipy. Like her descriptions are like uh, gossipy. She talks about some uh, stories that happened, um, especially like people spending a lot of money and having a very luxurious, uh, lifestyle. She talks about also the, the tea tasters uh, and uh, well, this were uh, spitting the tea in a huge spittoon in the, in the tea room, tea tasting room. Uh, and she talks about different uh, <laughs> uh, things uh, here. And uh, uh, well, it is pretty amusing, but it's not really, uh, I mean, like it's mostly uh, gossip about these people. Uh, so, <clears throat> What happened to them, to Victor and Mathilde, after they went back to Japan? Uh, well, uh, the period in Japan was the happiest for them uh, because after they went back to Europe, the, their balance of the couple started to uh, just uh, uh, lose, um, you know, the couple started to lose balance. And uh, um, well, uh, Victor, uh, on one side, he was starting to be. Um, just uh, seized again by his passion of gambling. And uh, she found out, like she was frustrated because when she, talk, she tried to talk about culture, art or something, he was always silent and he didn't like to talk about uh, just, yeah, he just liked to talk about practical things. Uh, so um, in this occasion, she met the French writer Arthur de Gobineau, which uh, we can see here. Uh, they were, um, well, they started actually a relationship which wasn't, uh, it was more like an intellectual relationship. They were friend, friends, we can say, but everybody was talking bad about them. Uh, it's difficult to think they had a real, like, uh, fair love affair because, well, he was much older than her. He, he was maybe 20 years, well, 22 years older. And, uh, yeah, uh, but this caused, like, uh, made uh, his family, Gobino's family, and Vittorio very upset, of course. And uh, yeah, it was a very, uh, the situation went, started to go very bad. And Vittorio was always nervous and was getting angry at her. So she decided to leave him in Stockholm. They just split up. It was impossible at that time for Catholic people in Europe. It was impossible to divorce. There was no way uh, they could divorce. Uh, also, she was a very close friend of the uh, princess of Italy, Margherita di Savoia, which will become the queen. The famous Pizza Margherita was born from like uh, when Queen Margherita went to Napoli. Actually, uh, yeah, her daughter also played with uh, her son. And... Um, also, um, from Japan, Mathilde and Vittorio brought back many objects, uh, which we can see here. This is a painting by Mathilde of uh, all her collection of Japanese objects, but they were sold at some point in 1888 for uh, just uh, financial problems. Uh, so there was an, an auction and uh, uh, all the, their object, objects, not all, but a large part of their of their Japanese, uh, well, objects were sold. And uh, another event uh, also completely destroyed this uh, marriage, which is the death of their daughter, 
when she was 18, in 1887. And uh, seven years later, so also Vittorio died and Mathilde uh, passed away in 1911. Uh, after well, spending her second part of her life as a painter. And uh, to uh, close up the talk, which has been pretty long, um, <clears throat> we can say that Mathilde was a really exceptional uh, woman. If we think about the period she lived uh, and the environment she, she was in, and uh, she was uh, very courageous, a, gr a good observer, and uh, she had humor as well. And she had a protective um, attitude towards her men, like Vittorio and also uh, Arthur de Gobineau. And at the same time, she was an elegant Parisian and uh, sometimes naive, sometimes whimsical, and, uh, but really sensitive and with a um, sense for artistic creation. And uh, uh, she had... Uh, as I said before, a very uh, constant conflict between these two parts. And, but anyway, uh, when such a person comes into contact like with a just particular world as uh, Japan is, uh, the result is, uh, of course, uh, um, very uh, special, we can say. And uh, well, her writings about Japan, China, and the world are also a result of um, her exceptional freedom of action. And also she was the wife of a diplomat and she could uh, actually see some uh, historical facts they're making, like the major restoration uh, from, well, an outsider point of view. And uh, well, she could have a lot of information, not only from her husband, but from other people, from Italians who were selling weapons in in northern Japan to the, uh, to the northern uh, um, alleys of the Tokugawa. Uh, <laughs> well, there are different stories around. Uh, but anyway, um, she is one of the rare, of the few Western uh, females, female who just traveled, traveled into the interior of Japan and uh, wrote about this period of, uh, of its history. And uh, of course, uh, as I said also before, the political influence of Italy in Japan is not really uh, relevant if compared to other countries, but uh, the Italian sources of uh, this period, especially of Japan and China, are, they might be interesting for, inter for international scholars because they give um, a fresh, a new third party, third party point of view of the situation of how Japan was just dealing with the uh, foreign powers. Uh, so um, like how the conflict between Britain and France was going on and uh, uh, different things. And also, yeah, uh, while I was working on these uh, documents and previous in previous research, I tended to uh, concentrate only on Italian sources. And I thought, well, when I started to study about uh, Mathilde, I, I saw like just I took in just information from, uh, for example, uh, I don't know, yeah, Ernest Sato or like uh, Lord Reddesley, uh, like um, Mitford, uh, and then uh, uh, so Parks. And there is a new world opening up for me. And this is very uh, stimulating, very important. Uh, I, didn't uh, actually, uh, well, I read it a uh, long time ago, but uh, reading through all these uh, different countries, also the uh, Max von Brandt uh, diaries, also uh, French, just, uh, well, there are also the von, Pols von Polsbrook, uh, I don't know the exact pronunciation, but different points of view. And uh, uh, this is a very stimulating. Uh, research in this way. Um, so, uh, since Mathilde's uh, documents are the first Italian source ever to be translated into English, uh, I really hope that uh, they can be useful to uh, researchers uh, worldwide. And uh, uh, with this, I finish my talk. Uh, sorry for being for talking too much. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, the talk 
and uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> for every questions, uh, well, I yes, know, we have, yes, we there have are. Time. There's been quite a chat. Well, we might go a few minutes over past eight thirty if that's okay. But if people have yes. to leave, yeah, if people okay. have to leave, I understand. But let's go through the questions. They're pretty great. Okay. Um, Shall I stop the? Okay. Uh, no, go go back to the beginning of the slide presentation. Okay. Uh, let me think. I keep it like this, so I just keep. Oh, good it idea. Smaller. Okay, Ju Julian Kulaford asked uh, near the beginning, "Why is yes. it that they had to get their silkworms from Japan? Did China not allow exports at the time, or were their silkworms contaminated with the disease too?" Mm, well, uh, it wasn't. Well, there were actually some people, some Italian traders, who went to China to. Uh, by the silk mags, but they weren't of the of good quality. Uh, the Japanese silk mags were much better; uh, they gave better results. Uh, in China, they went in uh, late fifties, eighteen fifty nine. There was an expedition to China, an Italian expedition to get the the eggs, but they weren't. Uh, they they didn't just bring good results. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and also Japan was opened and uh, the French started to bring Japanese circle max to Europe and they had very good results. So, and also Japan was protected from the disease because the disease was spreading together with the traders, like with the movements, was following the movements of the traders and because they, they did experiments and uh, did, well, they brought uh, some uh, circums with them. So uh, yeah, it worked out with Japan because Japan, the, the production sites were just uh, off limits for foreigners. So um, it was very, uh, well, they had, like Pebrin took some time to get into the uh, in inland Japan. Uh, so for this uh, reason, uh, the Italian could keep coming to Japan, well, they, they came almost every year, and uh, all these traders became very rich. They had <laughs> they had huge uh, profit from that. And um, uh, yeah, oh, I hope oh. uh, I could answer. Okay, okay. And Julian had another question. Isn't De La yes. Tour? I don't know. Do you want to put your slides back towards the beginning? Um, oh, Julian, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's okay. So Julian says, uh, isn't De La Tour a French name? And his wife was French. Was Count Cellier De La Tour part French too? Mm, well, he was from Savoy. And uh, well, this area on the, uh, on the Alps, which was, uh, well, um, the, the, where also the uh, kingdom uh, of Italy, the king of Italy was from, and uh, the De La Tour family was very close to the, um, the king's family, the Savoia family, and they were from. Uh, well, he was born. Uh, well, De La Tour was born in Torino, Torino, but his parents were from Savoia. He was completely Italian. He spoke French <laughs> because people from there now Savoia is part of France uh, because it was uh, was. Um, Seized to uh, France, and uh, uh, yeah, he he had a French name uh, from Savoy. So, mm. but you. he was uh, Italian. His nationality was Italian. Okay. Also, yeah. Okay. All right. And Alex, and, Bern oh, I'm sorry. Did you? Yeah, yeah. His wife was from Paris. Uh, she was uh, completely French, and she never uh, learned Italian very fluent like she never got to speak Italian very fluently she was mainly using French hello may I interrupt and say that was my question what language did they speak with each other nice. French. Le French 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 right yes yes, yes. Francese Francese exactly. <laughs> yes yeah he was writing some dispatches in uh, Italian to, to Italy of course and his Italian was uh, of course perfect um, I cannot see anything 
strange or like, uh, and uh, he used to write in French to the Japanese authorities. He couldn't speak, uh, he couldn't understand English, I think. The consul was understanding, he, he wrote in English, uh, Robecki, uh, write in English. And yeah, but he could speak Italian and French. But French was still okay. And he had, uh, well, there were many interpreters uh, who, also Japanese interpreters who were working at the legation. But he didn't really want the Japanese interpreters because they weren't so good. They were mostly young people, very young people who had a very basic knowledge of French. So uh, he preferred uh, even Savio, who was seriously studying Japanese. I don't know how he was studying, but yeah, he had probably a book, a dictionary. And he started <laughs> also, to, also to write kanjis and uh, he just tried pretty seriously to do that. Many other traders, Italian traders, got to speak the language, but they never got to write it. So, yeah, uh, Savio is what uh, we Italians have to, just the closest person to maybe, like uh, we can say the Italian Ernest Sato. <laughs> 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 yeah, but we can compare them, of course. Uh, yeah, he was like really, um, well, he was active. He wrote uh, two books actually, uh, he wrote this one, um, the report of the mission, and then another one in 1874, uh, 74, about uh, Japan in general and uh, about another expedition north that time. Well, yeah, he was, uh, uh, he studied Japanese very seriously. Wow. Okay, okay. Um, Alex Byrne asks, are there any references in her writing to the photographer Felice Beato? Ah, Felice Beato. Felice Beato. No, 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 no. No, but uh, mm, no, there are not refer no references, and we don't know who was the photographer uh, ah. of the of the picture. I don't know if he was, it was him. I would think they would have met though, probably in Yokohama at some point, maybe. Yeah, yeah, there was like, there is a, a relative of the De La Tour family, mm. whose name is Jada Ripa, who uh, found somewhere, I don't know where, I met her only once, mm. and uh, she found some pictures by Felice Beato uh, in uh, some archive, in somebody of her family had them. Mm. Wow. And uh, she decided, she's a photographer, so mm. she decided to come to Japan and make some pictures in the same places that also, the Matilde went, mm. but she is uh, also a relative of the Telatul family. Mm. And uh, yeah, she just, she didn't work on the, on the documents. They weren't published yet. But yeah, she followed uh, a little bit. The, um, she, she read like where uh, Matilde went mm. and she went on the actual places. It's something that I would like to do as soon as the coronavirus will be over. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Going to Guma, Saitama, and like do all the, mm. uh, you know, uh, the trip. It would be interesting, I think. For uh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to go. Well, uh, last year, last last summer, but I couldn't. Mm. I hope maybe. Well, this year I don't know, but uh, maybe this autumn or like maybe next spring, I guess. Oh, okay. All right. So Ian Ian Ruxton asks. Um, were her insights into Japanese culture, would you describe them as especially insightful? Mm -hmm. About Japanese culture, uh, well, there are some um, parts which are uh, very uh, humorous and uh, entertaining, and she has some um, particular, uh, can I say, <laughs> points of view. But, uh, well, she's talking about, uh, she is also aware of that. If I write something about Japan, there is many, many other people before who write, who wrote mm -hmm. the same things, like mm -hmm. Olcock, just please read uh, rather for Olcock or like, uh, uh, well, other people who wrote about Japan and wrote like better things that, uh, than, I did, than I did. But uh, she has very, uh, what she writes is very spontaneous, very, uh, you know, um, it's very lively. Yes. Uh, we can have, we, we can see her um, 
we can imagine her in, in such situations because these documents are private documents. They are mm -hmm. like letters sent to the to her friend, and she had in mind uh, to publish them someday, but she never did. Right. Uh, she never maybe had the time mm -hmm. to just gather all the writings and put them together and publish them. So but it way, was a dream she had. So in a way, you are fulfilling her wishes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Mm. Yeah, but anyway. Um, yeah. But as a, as, a, as a lady, as a lady, I think, is there any other woman who was writing letters back from Japan in 60, 1867? I think very... Few, if very anything. few yes very yeah, few that's the um, important thing about her mm -hmm. yeah 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 well i don't know about lady parks because she went to the fujisan she went uh, like uh, well she traveled uh, in zones like they were beyond the treaty boundaries but i don't know if she ever i don't think she I ever mean, well yeah we need Robert. the most famous <laughs> is isabella bird but she's 1880 when yeah, she's, yeah 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 13 yes. years later so it's quite a long time yeah yeah, yeah. well yeah it's a uh, well it's very different it's uh they are different sources uh, isabella bird was a um, very experienced traveler she, yeah. she traveled uh, all around the world and yeah uh she came to japan also for this purpose and also to write the book and uh her book is very, very polished. Uh, mm. Well, well, it's made of letters, basically. But uh, yeah, so, and also she was older, I think, than Mathilde. Mathilde is sometimes a little bit immature. I think she has some uh, naive uh, uh, insights. So she's always enthusiastic about everything, <laughs> uh, and when she gets angry, she criticizes very harshly people. And she had some. You know, uh, maybe some immature uh, side. Also, she was complaining because the, the Italian government wasn't giving the, how do you say, uh, the medal to her husband. Uh, how do you say, uh, well, the honors. Uh, yeah. Kunsho, uh, Kunsho. Yeah, Kunsho. Yeah, the uh, medal or how do you say that? Award. The medal is right. The award, award of yeah. for uh, the grand uh, officer. Uh, Re recognition mm. yeah 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 yes the reconoscimento uh, we can say like. yeah oh. so yeah uh, he's complaining about that as well uh, so yeah, sometimes she has this uh, uh, immature sides but this is also interesting because <clears throat> um, it's very hard to find su such fresh uh, documents it's it's honest you could say yes 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 yeah 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 very yeah. honest yeah uh, you, you, i put in the question like um you said she wrote in italian ah uh, no 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 sorry uh, uh she wrote in french okay, uh, mostly okay because french. I, I i got a bit confused because she spoke uh, uh, to her husband in french and yes. i thought uh so why is she writing in italian okay no 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 uh no she, she, wrote, wrote, she wrote in french okay. and uh, uh she sometimes she wrote some letters also to savio in italian but uh, the italian wasn't very flu but maybe um okay okay yes, yes. Sorry, yeah. she she could understand italian and mm -hmm. she could write at some until some point but uh yeah you can say that uh, she wasn't native okay native speaker um Okay, and then we've got a question. I'm still having trouble with his name. Peter Cornet Cornets Cornetsky. 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 I'm still working on this. Um, he asked uh, on uh, slide number 33, I think it was. Okay. Yeah, 30, 33. 33. Yeah, that. Oh one. yes. Okay, he asked, is that a printed Nishkie or is it a painting? At, at the most, Nishkie consisted of three panels, but this seems much mm. longer. Maybe it's a painting. Oh, I think, well, uh, it looks like uh, Nishkie for, from here because, well, it, it's five Nishkie, one, like, um, for example, it's a very strange format, I think. And it was made um, as a scroll. I think it was wrapped up like a scroll. 
so yeah, usually niche kia is a uh, triptych, you can say, you know? um, and uh, sometimes it's like singles. It's very rare to find maybe a diptych or, but in this case, there are five, I think there are five sheets put together on the, uh, how do you say, horizontally. Yeah, then it's a pentatic. There are there painting. Are pentatic uh -huh. five panels. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a little well, like? But there, there are ukiyo-e mm. or even earlier um, printed hand scrolls. So oh, unless oh, oh, oh. you know, you can look at it really closely. The writing yeah. and the 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 skyline, for example, mm -hmm. look very much as though they are printed. Mm -hmm. um, there might be a little hand coloring. It's hard to tell. Yeah, I can't see. Yeah, it, it might be. It might be. Yeah, is there actually, any indication maybe. of the artist? Is there an artist seal or a no, no, seal? No, no, nothing. No, no, nothing. No, I, I checked it uh, when I went also to the De La Tour family. This one, I, I didn't actually go to the to Gumma because of the coronavirus, but uh, I got the pictures uh, which were taken for for the book actually. But uh, the one I saw is the the one in Italy. Uh, which is, well, uh, this is in a better condition, I think. Uh, that one is a little bit, uh, there are some spots or like some um, water marks uh, here and there. But I didn't find anything about the author. Mm. And yeah. I don't know how the many top, copies of this. The top blue exists. line, the blue line at the top looks. Yes, like, yes. That looks woodblock printed and the red yes. above mm. the mountain does. But maybe the, the characters might be hand written like a manuscript almost it's maybe kind of, or so. i i suspect yeah. it was printed and it could have been hand colored yeah. probably yes, uh, yes it's it's one possibility yeah all the, also it, it, mm. it's hard to see <laughs> yeah small. yeah yeah i'm no expert of ukiyo-e but uh or nishiki -e. uh, yeah i i think it's a printed thing but i don't i'm not sure about the colors Mm. Because uh, in the in the Italian the Italian nishkie was uh, framed in the in the living room, so I couldn't just take it out from the frame and, and uh, check it mm. by myself. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, that's the, the only. The question was: Is this the Italian delegation? Yes, yes. Yes, it is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have like uh, if we, I don't know, if I can. No, uh, maybe not. Mm, maybe I can try to. Ah. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was trying to make it bigger just to, to, to read the content. Read painting it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but we can. We have Conto de la Tour, uh, Baron Galvania Meazza, which is a silicone trader. Pia this is Piatti. This is Piatti, wow. the original name. Then Prato and Savio. Savio. Like this and then Nakayama, the interpreter. Mm. And then here we have like uh, Gaiko no Hito. Uh, what is that? Tomon. Uh, uh, <laughs> Tomonau. Uh, oh, Ukete Joshu. Yeah, it's, it's too small. <laughs> I, can't, I cannot read it properly. But it's like, uh, well, they are coming from. Magata, but which is Komagata, you write it with the kanjis. It's another town which is close there, and they are about to enter Maibashi mm -hmm. uh, town here. And uh, so, well, there's probably it's probably somebody from Maibashi who got this uh, note, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, but I'm not sure. Uh, also, yeah, we can ask to the. Mm, uh, to the person who owned this uh, Nishiki before, before giving it to the, to the museum. Uh, I, I asked him, I think I asked him, but he couldn't, uh, he didn't know. Uh, the grandson of Endo Sohead, which is the guy you can see here in Mathilde's sketches. Let's see. Uh, where? Oh, here, <clears throat> this person's uh, grandson. Wow. He had the, the Nishiki. And he's uh, in Guma. Well, he's uh, 
actually uh, well uh, he he was very happy when uh, we just uh, presented the documents by Mathilde and uh, the sketch uh, mm. of his uh, grand uh, grandfather so yeah okay it's and he gave the the work to the guma museum yes 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 mm -hmm. all right we've got about five more questions and they're probably okay. shorter answers on yeah, yeah, yeah. okay but alex byrne wonders any reference in her writings to shopping in yokohama for curios or silk items embroideries dresses shopping <sighs> Yes, yes. Uh, well, the, she talks about uh, sometimes about the bibelot, she calls them, uh, the curiosity, the curious trinkets, mm. we can say. Mm. Uh, she, well, she doesn't talk about uh, what actually she bought. Okay. Uh, she mm. talks about maybe at some point she mentions something, but I don't remember actually. Uh, uh, yeah, she, from time to time she talks about the, the curiosity shops. She talks yes. about the shop itself, which is really full of merchandise. Yeah. And uh, there is always uh, the man smoking the pipe and uh, his wife and the children uh, <laughs> who comes like, and then uh, she speak kind of uh, pidgin language mm. to the shopkeeper. Mm. Uh, and she does shopping like that, but there are no details about the objects she bought, but they bought a lot of things. Mm. Um, uh, okay. Can you go to slide 53? 53. Okay. The one with the painting of all of her possessions? Oh, uh, uh, okay. Uh, this yeah. One, yeah. yeah, okay. So Peter Kay in London asks, he says, fascinating, and a lot of research must have gone into this. Did you manage to find any of their Japanese possessions? Uh, well, uh, when I went to the uh, Salier de la Tour castle, it's a huge palace. Um, and I asked the lady, I have to go to the toilet. Sorry, where is the toilet? I went to the toilet and there was, uh, how do you say, a folding screen on the fan <laughs> in the toilet. <laughs> I, well, what is this doing here? I mean, like, is this authentic? Is this original? It's, I don't know what was doing there, but I think it's something from the mage something that uh, Mathilde took back uh, and it was like bang, the toilet like that. Uh, but there are some objects like maybe uh, this, um, I don't know what is this, but, uh, some vases or like some uh, boxes and, uh, but they are uh, scattered. They are scattered around uh, like different relatives because there is a, uh, also a branch of the family which is in Sicily, uh, another one which is uh, in France. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, some people has still has some um, objects from Japan, which probably were brought back by uh, Mathilde and Victorio. But most of them, there is a research uh, which is in Spanish uh, about the collection they had and the items that were sold at the auction. Uh, I didn't really just, um, uh, how do you say, uh, see that because I, I, I found it out the very last part of, the, of my research. Uh, so I still didn't um, delve into it so much. Anyway, yeah, uh, it is very interesting, I think, to find out what she actually brought back from Japan. And there is a catalog of the auction it's did very they, hard to find. Did they sell them anything connected with the Barcelona World Fair of 1888, perhaps? Maybe, because like, mm. yeah, uh, the writer is Spanish and I think she's from, I don't know, from Barcelona, but uh, she wrote in Spanish uh, the thesis. So it might, it might have something to do. But I didn't see, I didn't see the uh, original catalog. I just know about its uh, existence by this, uh, paper that was written. written right. yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Michael Plastel wonders, did she collect any Japanese art? And I wonder also how she reacted to Japanese music. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, Japanese music, she doesn't mention that. Well, she mentioned, uh, of course, the, the monks, but 
Now that I think about that, she doesn't really <laughs> talk about Japanese music. Uh, okay. Uh, Japanese art, uh, well, she was, she liked it, I think, but, uh, but she doesn't talk about uh, so much about art. And okay. Music. Okay, Michael also asked, then there's the Italian garden on the bluff. Did that date from that era? Uh, no, I don't think, I think it's uh, later uh, okay. than that. Mm. All right. Yeah, uh, the Italia, uh, yes, uh, on the bluff of Yokohama. Right. Uh, I've been there a couple of times, uh, but yeah, uh, I think it's, um, that, that name comes from, uh, late, um, maybe late uh, 90s, 80s or 90s. Because mm. there, uh, the original, well, it's not, the, the first um, legation, first Italian legation was in Benton. Well, it was in the foreign settlement and moved to Benton. Uh, I don't think it has something to do with the, the Italia garden. Or how is it called? Uh, I can't remember. Um, Italia, uh, well, the Italian garden. The Italian garden on the bluff? Uh, uh, I have no idea. Uh, yes. Uh. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, but I know, uh, I know, I know. I, I remember that when I went to Hama. Okay, there's just two more questions. Um, yes. Uh, Michael Plasto is also asking, this is an interesting question, I think. Did they try to teach the Japanese about Italian culture? Yes, yes, yes. She's talking about um, uh, a man who actually was uh, really into art uh, when she went to uh, maybe Takasaki, around Takasaki. And there was a man who was really uh, interested in art and drawings. And she and Meazza were drawing uh, sketches. And he wanted them to write a sketch of uh, some Italian monument or something. Uh, so she wrote something about uh, Italian uh, monuments uh, and gave it to him, gave a sketch to him. And the same did uh, Meazza, the Circle Mac trader who was with them. And uh, that is, yeah, actually there was a, a part about the uh, artistic uh, uh, topics, but uh, yeah, not really about Japanese art artworks mm. Mm. okay okay okito toyota had a couple of questions about the procession he wondered um there's did the italian mission pass by the north of edo in saitama yes uh, yes uh we can see that because there was this um shibusawa eichi hero of the period drama lived in Saitama Prefecture and his there's scenes where his family is raising silkworms. So he wondered if the person yes, 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 went yes. by. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't think he, they met uh, with the Shibusawa uh, family. They met uh, another person who is uh, Tajima, Tajima Yahe is called, uh, who wrote some treaties, three, uh, uh, how do you say, no? uh, treatise about silkworms. Um, the Yosan Shindon is called in Japanese, uh, but uh, yeah, they didn't have contacts with the Shibusawa family. Um, also, yeah, the, this zone is famous also for the, the Guma uh, zone is famous for the Tomioka Seishijo, which is like the Tomioka silk uh, factory, right? Uh, which was built in uh, well, 1872, and now it became. Uh, like World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, oh. yeah. Okay, and then uh, Toyota-san is also asking, is this procession, this daimyo procession, is this the Italian mission? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were traveling like daimyos because they were um, very curious, but uh, foreigners were taken, like what they were just, mm, Treat like a, a daimyo, uh, oh. or like the emperor. Like uh, at some point, there is um, a problem with the expedition. They arrive in a town and they don't they don't find anything ready. <laughs> so 
So uh, Victor, Vittorio complains about uh, with, the, with the head of the village or one of the guards, I don't know, of the mission. And then uh, they punish the uh, culprits who didn't prepare the, the stables and didn't prepare the beds. And, uh, and then they arrested him. <laughs> they tied up with a rope and they tied him up with a rope and then broke him to the prison. Uh, after one hour telling them, you have to treat them like the Mikado. They are not just regular Toji. They have to be treated like the Mikado himself. So yeah, uh, there was also this happening during the trip. Also, they had two Betos fighting each other with a sword and injuring each other. And what? well, there are different stories uh, which are pretty entertaining. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, this is the last question, and okay. I'm not sure what the question is, but a Alex Byrne said to me, try and squeeze in my book plate question. Oh. Alex, what is your go, book go plate question? Go to 8.20 p.m., Patricia. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going, I'm going 8.20. Uh, the book plate you showed had Salier spelled with one L, but is it actually two L's? Yes, yes. Yeah, I don't know why, but uh, that is the, the family crest yeah. I got from the Salier de la Tour family. And it's probably, well, um, it's written with two L's. Okay. But uh, maybe that's uh, more uh, an older one. Oh. And it's written with just one L. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. It's, uh, I was wondering as well. Uh, because, yeah, here, um, this is the family crest of the de la Tour family, yeah. the horse. And uh, yeah, it's Salier de la Tour. But uh, usually now the, the family has two L's two and uh, also he was always registered with the two L's, also an official document, so. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be older, I think. It's a very old, it's from a very old book. Okay, well, I think that wraps it up. I have one more question, may I? Okay, okay. Yeah. It, I may have misunderstood this, but she was intellectually friendly with mm. with uh, Arthur de Gobineau, Arthur de Gobineau. But he was a notorious racist. Uh, yes, 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 yes. And, she was like, and, and, and she was like waiting dangerous stuff. Her experience, because it seems to me that <laughs> she has a very enlightened view of of you know the the whole thing about the cleavage and and nakedness and all that that is really really interesting yeah uh, yeah, yeah yeah you know yeah, but how did, age. how did she relate to to gobino who's a really bad i mean well by our <laughs> standards a, you know a, a, a uh, bad, you no, know she was she like, like uh, they were discussing about the races like well uh, in the 19th century this was a very um yeah common art uh, like a topic between the intellectuals and scientists etc but uh, yeah, she was talking. She, they were fighting about. I, I don't know whether I did, I read this. But uh, they were fighting about the um, fact that Gobineau didn't um, consider uh, the uh, Asian uh, races uh, uh, like uh, sort of some level. I don't know. But she was very um, trying to convince him that uh, the Japanese were. Uh, just uh, the, how do you say, I don't know, but a very uh, superior race uh, in Asia. Uh, she was trying to convince her. She, she went to Japan, so she, she knew she had just contacts with the Japanese people. Uh, but I don't know, like, I don't remember why, when I read this. Maybe it's uh, in some French uh, biography of Gobineau, because in French biographies, uh, of about Gobineau, uh, there are also many uh, information about Mathilde as well. And you have to put it, you, late years. We have to put this all in historical perspective. We can't be judgmental <laughs> about those people, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I just I didn't uh, delve too much into uh, Gobineau because I had <laughs> to work on the Japanese documents. But um, yeah, there is a lot of work uh, which has been done before about. Uh, uh, Gobineau and uh, like uh, his treatise about the races, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, 
Uh, how, there how, are many still. I have how still many. How many people many. know about his relationship no, with her? This is absolutely fascinating, and and you're to be congratulated on digging it all up. Mm. <laughs> It's yeah, well, true. people knew about that because they, they weren't uh, hiding it so much. If we see here, we can see here the photograph. I, I think it's very strange, but well, uh, she and Gobineau were sitting one yeah. like, on, on the side. And we have Vittorio here, like yeah. on the back. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's very strange, I think, for the time. And uh, yeah, I don't know about the other people. This is a book. Um, Swedish, uh, which talks about, uh, like, uh, well, about Mathilde de la Tour, actually. It's a um, short um, memoir of um, some person, uh, which I forgot the name, uh, who talks about um, Mathilde de la Tour. And she talks about uh, this relationship with Gobineau, and, uh, well, it was well, well known. Uh, everybody was. Uh, knowing that, and they weren't hiding. I think uh, they were just friends. She said, "And so, we have to take her her word on that." I don't know, but uh, I don't think they were. They had. They were in a relationship because she had a very tight relationship with the queen. I don't think she was hmm. like crossing some lines. So yeah, there are many. Uh, also, Gobineau's uh, biographers uh, write that this relationship wasn't a love affair. Uh, there are many sources that um, can be relied, but uh, yeah, for this we have to just check all the documents. There is a huge file about Gobineau at the Delatour's family. And that's interesting as well. For now, I just put the uh, just put together all the documents about Japan, but there is a lot to do. I think uh, there would be uh, a lot to, um, to find out about this. Uh, but yeah, it goes beyond my. Uh, also, now I cannot go back to Italy. I cannot go back for <laughs> seeing my family. So uh, yeah. Well, should we really on like that? On that note, should we perhaps draw this to a close and give, give some yes, applause? Yes. I've got to stop the recording too. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> what an amazing, a wonderful talk. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for wonderful. coming. And uh, good. yeah, I hope you, you enjoyed uh, the talk. If you have some more questions, please uh, contact me at my uh, email address. I just send it to the chat. Uh,